Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome. My name is Duncan Brown from the Institute of Employment Studies, and we're delighted to welcome you uh, this morning. Um, you can see some of you um, still logging in. We're expecting uh, well over 100, so um, we should be able to get a good uh, discussion going at the end. Um, the purpose of the uh, webinar this morning is really to look at our new uh, research report on uh, obesity stigma at work, uh, improving uh, inclusion and productivity. And I guess, uh, yeah, this morning, amidst the gloomy headlines of of um, more lockdown uh, in the southeast, at least in uh, London, and um, a pretty awful set of employment figures, um, it's nice really to to step back a bit and look at some uh, research. The pandemic really has highlighted, I think, um, the inequalities that we have in society and also made us think a bit more about uh, how we treat each other. And I think this is a real key area that certainly, um, if your reaction is similar to mine on first see reading the report, um, it's a little bit of shock in terms of just uh, the way uh, folks are treated, uh, but also hopefully positively and one of what we want to get onto with all the speakers and, and hopefully addressing as many of your questions as we can, um, the uh, how we address uh, some of the uh, discrimination and unequal treatment um, that um, is, is evident when we look at obesity. Now, um, we, I'm going to be religious on timekeeping this morning because we, we want time for your questions. We've got a great lineup of folk uh, to speak on it. Uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Stephen and Zafia, uh, Dr. Uh, Zafia Bardrek and uh, Professor Stephen Bevan uh, from IES. They've been the authors of the report and uh, are real uh, experts in the, uh, the whole area. Um, so they'll be giving us an overview of the findings and, and addressing your questions on the specific report. Then we've got, um, as always delighted to welcome uh, Dame Carroll, uh, Dame Carol Black, who in terms of, uh, well, goodness me, when was the original uh, NHS report, Carol? 2010 or something like that in terms of, you know, putting <laughs> occupational health on the HR agenda and keeping it there. Uh, Carol uh, must be seen as, uh, as the leading UK light on that. She continues to advise uh, NHS improvement. Um, and uh, Public Health England on health and work. And it's obviously been incredibly busy uh, this year with all the, uh, the work arising from the pandemic. Um, for someone like me who's tr struggling trying to establish some part-time portfolio jobs, Carol seems to uh, to manage it by having a number of full-time jobs that she, somehow she's chair of the, of the British Library and a number of, of institutions. So we're delighted to have you on, Carol. Um, and Pleasure. then also we've got, uh, so they're, they're all live like me, uh, and then we've also got some recorded contributions, because uh, I think the clinical, the sort of clinical employment as well as the social perspective on this is really important. And um, we've got a couple of those, and um, uh, we've got Dr. Tarani uh, coming up, but we're, we're going to start with uh, Sarah uh, Lebrock who kindly recorded a message uh, for us. Sarah is the director of um, Obesity UK. Uh, so obviously it's got a very well-informed uh, perspective on this. And we're just gonna kick off watching a little, uh, a little vlog from, from her. Hi, my name's Sarah Lebrock. I'm a director of Obesity UK and I'm someone who lives with obesity. I'm going to share with you today an experience that I've had of weight stigma in the workplace. I worked for a pharmaceuticals company, a global pharmaceutical company, and I worked in the sales team. And I worked with a, with a new boss that came along, kind of, he didn't choose me as part of his team. So after a couple of months, I asked Sarah to feedback, because I thought, you know, you didn't recruit me. So it'd be great to kind of know what your feedback is on me, what are, you know, how, how I'm performing, how things are going. So I, so I had a conversation with him and I said, you know, please, you know, just wondering how things are going, kind of what, um, what your first impressions of me have been um, and the result that I got back was not quite what I expected. So he, he turned around to me and said, well to be honest sir, he said, looking the way that you do, I thought you're going to have to be a bloody good sales rep to look the way that you do and sell a diabetes product. Um, 
And I literally was taken aback by that comment. I think um, at that point in time, I was still hugely um, in the mindset of this was all my fault, the way I looked, um, and that the fact that I was living with obesity was all my fault. So I felt hugely embarrassed, hugely ashamed. And so I just kind of giggled it off and kind of was, you know, smiled and kind of was like, mm, okay. Um, but actually looking back, I actually can't, I'm quite horrified that he actually thought that that was acceptable to have that sort of conversation with me. Um, because it's not, why do we think it's okay to comment on someone's, the way that their, their appearance or the way they look as an indicator of how good they are at doing their job or how good they are at doing something. Um, and that's what I kind of really want to change is we don't think somebody who has brown hair can do something better than someone that has blonde hair or someone with blue eyes or someone with a certain color skin or a certain gender. You know, we've kind of moved away from those um, kind of discriminations um, to some extent. Yes, they still exist, but we are moving away and know that it's not acceptable to think that way. However, when it comes to people that live with obesity and people in larger bodies, we still think it's acceptable to have this perception that they're not as good at their job, they're incapable, they're not as intelligent. Um, and this absolutely needs to stop. So I urge employers, the government, just society in general, to stop judging people that live in larger bodies and thinking that you know how intelligent they are or how capable they are at doing their job. Because actually, they are probably completely and utterly capable and more intelligent than you could ever imagine. Um, and I just think we really need to stop this discrimination. It's one of the last acceptable forms of discrimination. Um, and I just really hope that one day we will look back at the way we have treated people living with obesity and be absolutely, utterly horrified because we will understand that obesity is very complex. It's not someone's choice to live that way. And we need to take that blame culture away and actually treat people like equals. Everybody's an individual and just because they live in a larger body doesn't mean that they're a lesser person. Help ourselves, do we sometimes? Um, the um, yeah, productivity, particularly in the current situation is, is really hard and motivating folk to perform. And you hear examples like that, goodness. Um, but the, no, we're very grateful to Sarah for contributing. Um, and um, I guess we, we can put the details of Obesity UK who, who've given support to a number of well-known employers on this. Uh, we'll, we can put that in the sort of chat box as well as the research report. Now, the research report is the first output of purpose, uh, which I, if I can remember what the mnemonic stands for is uh, promoting understanding and research into productivity uh, obesity stigma and employment and it's um, a generously funded by Nova Nordisk and um, yeah as all things IES it's about getting evidence uh, for improving employment practice and um, uh, the experience at work and thereby uh, productivity and performance and um, Obviously, this this particular report focusing very much on uh, BST. Uh, so, Dr. Sophia uh, carried out uh, for Steve a lot of the uh, research, and uh, I'm going to hand over to her now. She's going to chat for about ten to fifteen minutes about the key findings. Uh, just give us a bit of a skim of the report, Sophia. So thanks, Duncan, for that great introduction, and it's my pleasure also to welcome you all to this webinar this morning on what I think and what IES thinks was a really important topic. Um, as you can imagine, um, there are a lot of people who work behind the scenes um, when such reports come out. And so I would also like to publicly thank IES colleagues, um, Steve O'Rourke and Sarah Butcher for their help in um, getting the report out and completed to such a great standard. And um, as Duncan has just said, I would also like to add our thanks to um, Sarah LeBrock and Abdurani not just for their videos that you have and will see this morning, but also for providing a lot of help and advice in the report as part of our expert advisory group. So thank you to everybody involved and who has helped us on this um, project so far. So just a quick introduction of um, what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to start with an introduction to the Purpose Programme and um, why it's, it's important to be looking at this topic of obesity and stigma employment right now. Then a discussion about the nature and the causes and prevalence of overweight and obesity in the UK. 
theories about um, why this weight-based stigma occurs and its prevalence. And finally, but I think most importantly in this situation, I'll be talking about how weight-based stigma is evident in every stage of the employment um, cycle and what we could be doing about it. So why now? Well, I think this quote on the slide really highlights um, why purpose and why now. Um, but I think it's also important to add that obesity is one of the most complex and challenging and controversial public health issues facing a lot of modern developed economies at the moment. And I, I don't think it's a lie to say that levels of overweight and obesity are still rising. But it's also a public health issue that a lot of people think that they can have an opinion about. And sadly, it's normally negative. And open discrimination against people living with obesity seems to remain acceptable. And it's this stigma and discrimination that's prevalent in all aspects of society, really, that's uh, creating a real barrier to making any progress in reducing its prevalence. Also, it seems that nowadays you can't get through a presentation without mentioning COVID-19. As Duncan said in his introduction, this pandemic has once again brought any social inequalities um, to light. And this is true with obesity, um, with research indicating that those living with obesity have an elevated vulnerability to the virus. Um, our very own Prime Minister, after his hospitalisation, um, with COVID and in his following Better Health campaign that was launched, um, said, I was overweight, I was too fat, and that is what caused um, me to have a bad case of COVID. He himself there was using stigmatising language and some of the Better Health campaign was promoting a seemingly eat less, do more strategy highlighting once again that simplistic understanding of the causes of obesity. So as a result of this and some previous work that IES has published looking into the nature of obesity and how it and um, how it has an impact on employment, IES launched the Purpose Programme and this has a number of main aims. So the first is to frame this debate about obesity, stigma and discrimination and employment. And it aims to illustrate that much more can and should be done to rethink this issue of overweight and obesity and to try and change that narrative from thinking about obesity as a cost to society and as a cost to employment to focus on what inclusiveness and richness and the improved productive capacity that could be had if um, in the labour market, if this systematic disadvantage faced by those living and working with obesity were eliminated. I think another aim of the programme is to provide clear and accessible evidence about the reasons why the level of and the implications of stigma faced by those working and living with obesity. And finally, but no less importantly, we think it's really now time to move that dial from analysis to action. So we have the evidence based and by providing this evidence base and then providing recommendations from it um, for a number of relevant stakeholders, we hope to move um, to action for better supporting people living with obesity to help them enter, stay, but most importantly, thrive at work. So I'm not a clinician and I am aware that there may be a number of clinicians viewing this morning um, who may be a lot more qualified than I am to discuss the nature and causes of obesity. So please accept my prior apologies. But um, here is my attempt at defining obesity and its prevalence in, in the UK. So defining obesity is actually more complex than it may seem. The World Health Organization defined overweight and obesity as an abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that may impair health. Typically, overweight and obesity are classified through the body mass index measure. 
And this has been seen as an easy way to obtain and use calcula calculations of overweight and obesity of both individuals and vast populations. But for some, it's seen as a very crude measure and other measures have been developed to help um, improve um, definitions of obesity. And that um, those include the waist to hip ratio, uh, body fat ratio and the Edmonton obesity staging system. There are also now many debates as to whether obesity should be classified as a disease. Um, a number of national and international bodies have started to recognise obesity as a disease. It was named as such earlier this year in the German parliament and recognised as a chronic disease in Italy last year. But the debate is still very much ongoing in the UK. Those for the motion argue that a recognition of obesity as a disease will necessitate a change of approach and improve better treatment options for those currently living with obesity. And so the debate continues here in the UK. I think it's also important to add that those living with obesity um, may also be at a higher risk of developing other uh, physical or mental comorbid conditions. And these may also require an element of treatment, but it may also have an impact on employment. The most common of these comorbidities include type 2 diabetes, um, some, for, some forms of cancer, osteoarthritis and heart disease. So on to a little bit about the prevalence of obesity. I think over the last few decades, the number of people worldwide classified as living with overweight or obesity has increased. And it is now viewed as a growing risk to a number of people in developed nations. The prevalence of obesity is also increasing amongst younger generations, with recent statistics suggesting that over 340 million children and adolescents between uh, the ages of five and 19 have overweight or obesity. In England, forecast data suggests that if trends continue at their current rate, by 2050, 60% of males and 50% of females will be living with obesity. Um, in the report that is downloadable from IES, there is, more, there is a more detailed discussion about the nature and prevalence of overweight and obesity across all the devolved nations. So please, uh, please do go and have a look at that. But what is obesity? Well, it's becoming increasingly more important to recognise the complexity behind the causes of obesity. British societal attitude research still reveals that 81% of those surveyed agreed with the statement that most people who live with overweight or obesity do so because they eat too much and exercise too little. And this is still very much a common assumption that eat less, do more rhetoric is still very prevalent, especially among the media. However, those of us who have worked um, within obesity or have researched obesity a little bit more, realize that the issue is far more complex than that. Um, the Foresight Report, um, first published in 2007, and we have adapted a, a model, the model of the Foresight Report for you today, um, shows that causes of obesity are more complex, multifactorial, and, and are often interrelated and include a number of influences. And I'm just labeling a few here, but we have the individual's biology, um, an individual's environmental surroundings, including their access to areas for physical recreation and access to healthier food. And all this is very much related to social and economic inequalities and how unequal distribution of things like income and goods, resources and living conditions can lead to a number of health inequalities. And this is also very much shown in the work by um, Michael Marmot. And finally, um, the way in which employment is designed and conducted, for example, the nature of shift work, the hours that people work, and the, the psychosocial factors of work can all have an influence on the development of obesity. 
So it's important that we look beyond that eat less, do more rhetoric. Alongside the rise in the prevalence of overweight and obesity has also been this associated increase in the pervasive weight based stigma and discrimination that people living with obesity experience. So we've heard from Sarah LeBrock this morning, but we also know that such attitudes have been reported in a number of settings, including education, employment, healthcare, within an individual's family, and even among people living with obesity themselves. So a number of theories have been developed in an attempt to explain why this can occur. Attribution theory suggests that people evaluate how much an individual is personally responsible for causing success or failure. And in the case of obesity, negative stigma is thought to arise towards people living with obesity as a perception, as a result of the perception that an individual's weight is under their personal control. Then there's the idea of the thin ideal. And this hypothesizes that weight-based stigma can arise as a result of the degree to which an individual um, buys into what societal standards seems to be attractive and how then people change their thoughts and behaviours to that accordingly. I think it's also important to highlight the role of the media and they do have a large role to play. People living with overweight or obesity are usually portrayed negatively in the media and that's all forms of media, not just the press, but on YouTube, on social media usually portraying people living with obesity in unflattering or dehumanising ways, um, often without heads, but focusing on people's um, midriffs or their waist. Or they typically use stereotypical images of individuals eating unhealthy food or partaking in a more sedentary lifestyle. Such images are rarely challenged and are often partnered with journalists not using people first language. And people first language is now commonly used when discussing other chronic long term health conditions. However, with obesity, it's still not common to use that. So a number of studies have reported just how frequently employees um, with overweight or obesity experience this weight based stigma at work. Our research highlighted that weight-based stigma occurs more frequently for females in comparison to males. And this could provide more evidence towards theories surrounding this aesthetic labour market. Um, weight-based stigma is reported among both co-workers and colleagues, as well as in employers, line managers and supervisors, and even sometimes with HR professionals. And it's also apparent that weight based stigma becomes more prevalent um, as an individual increases their weight. So what about weight based stigma and employment? Um, we know, and there's lots of evidence to show now, that good work is really important for a productive workforce. And I'm sure Dame Carol might talk about some of that later. And we know that good work comprises a number of factors, things like fairness, effort and reward balance, giving an employer a voice at work, supportive line management, just to name a few. But what our report really found was employees living with obesity may not experience this good work. And Quite surprisingly and, upsetting, and upsettingly, weight-based stigma occurs at every stage of the employment cycle. So, for example, if we start in the recruitment and selection process, first chance of uh, somebody living with obesity um, being able to promote and try and prove themselves at work, Studies have suggested that when individuals are given vignettes, photos or films about participants, um, employees were less likely to recommend candidates living with obesity, even when all other information such as job qualifications, educational background, um, employee experience was held constant. 
candidates living with obesity when applying for sales roles, for example, were more likely to be placed in telephone sales roles rather than in face-to-face -face positions. These effects were once again more evident for women in comparison to men. So that's recruitment and selection. When it comes to developing employee relationships and well-being, we know that one of the important aspects of work is having strong working relationships and good support in the workplace. However, there was evidence to suggest that employees living with obesity may not have such positive employee relationships. And this had negative impacts on their health and well-being. Um, there was evidence to suggest that employees living with obesity were trying to overcompensate to remove such stigma involving working over hours or managing their perceptions at work, which often led to, to lower well-being, lower job satisfaction. So some more evidence of this stigma and bias having an effect on people living with obesity. There was also evidence to suggest that employees with obesity may not receive fair performance appraisals um, and this had implications for progression, promotion and um, pay opportunities and as Steve will discuss later this added to this wage penalty that people living with and living and working with obese, obesity experience. Lived experience research also highlighted that weight-based stigma for promotion can occur even when an employer's weight was completely irrelevant to their performance in their role. Finally, but uh, as importantly, there is evidence in the literature that obesity can result in instances of wrongful termination of employment. Um, there is evidence to suggest that those living with obesity may also be a factor that leads to earlier retirement. Individuals living with obesity and severe obesity were overrepresented among those aged 55 and above who had retired from work. And sadly, there was also evidence that those living and um, working with obesity or trying to work with obesity couldn't get work. And so they were um, high, more highly represented in those who were unemployed. So that's just a really brief introduction to some of what we found in our report. And I'm going to hand back to Duncan now. Thanks, Sophia. Um, do you know, one of the great things working with Sophia as a colleague is not just that she's a really expert researcher, but she really cares about this stuff. Um, and I know there's, there's one view of research that is a totally um you know objective process don't bring emotion into it but this stuff is important and Zafia cares about it and i think in research and in practice we need to start getting a bit angry about this stuff frankly and start doing something um about it um now again trying to be positive uh, and uh, we'll come on to what then can we all be doing about this in our uh, in employment and in our organizations but um um, yeah, one of the positive outcomes of the pandemic, if there are any, is, has been the, the re-establishment, if you like, of respect for experts. And so, as Savaya said, we, we really regarded it as important uh, to get uh, medical expertise uh, into this uh, work as well. And uh, again, Dr. Uh, Tarani has kindly given us a little vlog uh, to give um, his perspective on uh, on uh, on the work, which we're going to see now. Hello, my name is Abid Tahrani. I'm a senior lecturer and a consultant endocrinologist and bariatric physician from Birmingham, UK. Obesity stigma is very prevalent in healthcare systems and the wider society globally. The UK is no different where obesity stigma is also very common within the healthcare system and in the wider society. While the consequences of obesity stigma on the mental and physical health of people living with obesity and on the interactions with the healthcare system are well described, the impact of obesity stigma on discrimination at workplace is far, is far less recognized and less spoken about. And that's why the recent report from the Institute of Employment Studies 
about obesity stigma at work is an important and welcome addition in this area. Many employers infer negative personal, performance, or leadership stereotypes based on the employee appearance or obesity. This stigma leads to reduced chances of employment for people living with obesity, and if employed, it leads to lower income. However, we need to help employers and the human resources personnel to develop their understanding about the disease process leading to obesity and that having obesity does not mean laziness or lack of abilities. In fact, many highly successful professionals and leaders in their fields from all walks of lives have obesity. Discrimination against obesity, uh, discrimination against people living with obesity in terms of employment and income should not be acceptable or tolerated, particularly with the evidence linking obesity to social deprivation and inequalities. Wow, how kind. Um, really helpful perspective there from Dr. Tarani. And I think introducing um, some other aspects, which um, which Steve's going to go and talk about in a minute, I'm particularly interested with the, the interaction of the different aspects of discrimination, and particularly here with, uh, with we've seen about gender already and um, ethnicity and um, the potential impacts then as Sophia uh, indicated right across the uh, employment uh, cycle. Uh, now, if, um, if Carol was, is, is so, um, has such a significant influence in the policy sphere, uh, Stephen, who's going to give us a bit more now and, and talk a bit more about uh, the findings and what we can do about them uh, in terms of employers, uh, has a major influence uh, on this, and um, uh, Steve, uh, let's um, let's hand over to you to to share that expertise. Um, thanks, Duncan, um, and hi everyone. Yeah, I'm just going to finish off a couple of uh, additional points, um, following on from Zafia to talk about the obesity wage penalty, particularly. Um, but I want to also just focus on um, what the sort of areas of action. Are that we've identified for different stakeholders, uh, primarily government, employers, healthcare professionals, and the media. Um, and then I'll tell you a little tiny bit about what the, the uh, research program, the purpose program that we have, has got in store for the rest of this year and, uh, and next year. Um, so I'm going to talk about, first of all, the wage penalty. So Zafia talked uh, um, very eloquently about the compelling evidence around different aspects of the employment cycle. Um, the different touch points that people living with obesity have um, as they join an organization uh, an organization as they uh, experience life within it. Um, I'm going to focus on the part that uh, looks at the uh, the wage penalty. I'm trying to get my slides to move. there we go. Um, so back in 2016, Dane Carroll chaired a review for the government looking at different aspects of treatment for people. Uh, living with alcohol and drug addiction, but also living with obesity. And some of us in the field um, wondered why obesity was in the same category um, as ad addiction um, to drugs and alcohol. Um, and Carol uh, and her team sensibly treated obesity as a very different uh, category and had some di different recommendations. But as part of the analysis they did, they identified um, about a 10% wage gap between people living with obesity and those people with average weight. Um, and that triggered for us uh, the desire to look into this in a bit more detail because obviously looking at the, the gap in earnings um, is the answer to one of the so what questions. You know, if we're worried about um, stigma and discrimination, what are the practical outputs and implications for individuals and their families if they are living with obesity and, they, and uh, they're suffering from discrimination and stigma in the labour market and in workplaces? And the wage penalty is a really concrete example of how some of those, um, uh, some of that st stigma uh, manifests itself in reality. Um, now, we are interested in not just the size of the wage penalty, but what are the factors contributing to the gap, and also what the direction of causality is. Because um, once you get into the detail of this, it's really clear that um, there are different ways of looking at it. So it's quite timely, of course, that um, we are now referring a couple of times to Professor Sir Michael Marmot, given that he's published. A new paper this morning looking at um, the impact of COVID on widening inequalities. Um, his 
previous work on the social determinants of health identifies really clearly that there's a link between poverty, uh, employment or unemployment, uh, or poor quality employment, health inequalities and obesity. And that shows very clearly there's a strong risk that if people are living in relative deprivation, the risk of developing obesity uh, increases. So that's clearly one direction of causality. But at the same time, um, the causality can work in, a, in the opposite direction or the counter direction. The living with obesity is, according to the research that we've reviewed, also linked to lower wages, lower household income, and, and that effect happens through the life course because of gaps in education, poorer health and employment discrimination. So in some senses, there's a sort of double whammy because the wage penalty um, and the wage differentials work in two different directions. So our review really was a try and, about trying to shed more light on what that pay, wage penalty was about and some of the causal factors. And I have to say some of the findings were quite shocking. Um, primarily because um, we found that the wage penalty worked uh, was in existence for women far more than men um, and there may be some quite significant and troubling reasons for that i mean overwhelmingly found that the evidence was that uh, women were more affected uh, we found quite a well many studies um, which showed uh, a gap of up to 20 percent with an average range somewhere between 9 and 13 percent some studies found no um, wage wage penalty, but the majority of them did. Um, this is not just manifesting itself in terms of wages and annual earnings. Um, there is also strong evidence of a life course impact so that people living with obesity in their adolescence um, carry the dis labor market disadvantage they experience right through into adulthood. And obviously, if we're trying to deal with this from a public health point of view in terms of um, helping to support um, children and adolescents who develop obesity, um, then this, this is one of the reasons we need to do it because um, labor market disadvantage and the wage penalty will be attached to those people or they're at a higher risk that they'll, they'll live with that, that difference throughout their career. Um, and we know that women li within, living with obesity at 16 have 34% lower household incomes at the age of 42. So it's not just um, their earnings, but the household income uh, that they they have as well so it has wide ramifications not just for individuals but also their families um here's just a, another few snippets from the review which goes into much more detail and and all the references are, are in the report um we found that there are studies showing that women women's earnings peak at a early body, body mass index of between 20 and 22 and then decrease as bmi increases and one study found that a one point increase in bmi led to a four percent drop in income within four years. Um, there are also studies showing that um, mothers who are living with obesity um, have almost um, have a compounded problem in that, that um, having uh, childcare responsibilities as well as living with obesity compared with mothers of average weight uh, can be considerable, 7% in this example. One study found that single mothers are living with obesity face a wage penalty of over 7% per child so um, as it, another child uh, arrives, um, the wage penalty gets compounded. Older women with BMO over 40 are more likely to have extended periods of sick leave and to leave employment early. And this is a study carried out uh, by colleagues uh, down in Southampton at the Life Course Epidemiology Unit, the uh, Centre for Musculoskeletal Health and Work, with the, the HEAF study, the Health and Employment After 50 study. And um, this is a cohort study that, that looked at um, groups of uh, workers over 50, um, it wasn't looking specifically at obesity as a, a determinant of premature withdrawal from the labour market. What it did find was that for, particularly for women, particularly if you control for age and other health factors, stigma and discrimination seems to play a really important part in determining um, whether people, or women are leaving the labour market early. And that is a troubling sign. So what about trying to explain um, the wage penalty? Well, there are four different um, theories um, which have been tested statistically in all the literature. The first are what you might call human capital differences. So the idea that women who are living with obesity have low educational attainment, perhaps have more limited work experience, are subject to occupational segregation into lower paid or lower skilled and lower status work. And that, can, that's, that research has found a link between obesity and what you might call occupational prestige. 
um, and both that affects both health and employment outcomes for women. Another explanation is, is around life course barriers so that women living with obesity find it harder to shake off the health and education inequalities of childhood and adolescence. And they risk living in lower income households because they're less likely to marry or cohabit than women of, of average weight. Um, some of the causes can be just directly related to health differences. So women living with obesity have more health conditions and more comorbidities that affect their ability to find and retain work. And those health conditions lead to reduced functional capacity, increased sickness, absence, and an ele elevated risk of leaving the labor market early. And then the stigma and discrimination factors. Um, so um, women living with obesity are subject to systemic, systemic discrimination in the jobs market and in workplaces. That means that they're sorted into low, uh, lower paying jobs um, for which they may be overqualified where opportunities for job, pay, job and pay progression are constrained. And we really mustn't forget this issue about progression in work and where negative stereotypes and weight based stigma are common and normalized. As so I mentioned, the aesthetic labor market it is really clear from some of this research that certainly in some service sector jobs, things like style, image, grooming, appearance, are seen, a, seen as a way of enhancing the customer experience. And that particularly affects women in service sector and customer facing roles. And we've seen examples from the hotel sector and the airline industry that have made you know, fairly um, unsubtle demands about particularly women working in those sectors and the way they look and their appearance and making requests of them um, you know, to look in a, look a certain way. And I think that that is one of the things that we are seeing, uh, certainly as we, we have shifted towards being a much more sector based, a service based economy that the aesthetic labor market uh, has played a big part in assessing our, our value, the value we attach to certain types of roles and to certain types of employees. And I think that is clearly of concern as it um, pertains to people living with obesity. In terms of what the cost is, um, we've done some analysis um, using some basic information about the, the average prevalence of um, obesity amongst the female workforce in the UK um, and um, average earnings. Um, We've calculated four scenarios. Um, the lower one is uh, assuming there's a, only a 2% wage penalty, and there were some studies down at this level. Um, that results, even if at that low level, had a, a wage penalty of 2.3 billion each year in terms of lost earnings, um, reduced annual earnings, annual earnings uh, for women, um, right up to a 13% wage penalty. And we could have gone up to a much higher number than this, but uh, nearly 15 billion. You can see that that has an effect not just on earnings, but of course, implications for tax revenue, um, for uh, consumer power, spending power, and so on. Um, and a very significant gap in earnings just because of um, living with obesity, which um, and, and the stigma and discrimination associated with it, which of course is very troubling. So the report has a number of recommendations for each of the main stakeholders uh, who can have an influence on reducing stigma in the labour market. Um, the first is government. Um, we think that it's important the government should provide some really clear guidance to employers about the legal status of obesity discrimination in employment. If obesity by itself isn't going to be included as a protected characteristic under the Equalities Act, then we think a clear, some clearer guidance should be made available to clarify what obesity related health conditions are included within its scope and what legal duties that implies for employers. We also think that the government should, as part of its obesity strategy, embed the principle that work has to be seen as a priority clinical outcome of care, recognising that the benefits of staying in and thriving in and returning sustainably to work should be embedded in the way that uh, we deal with obesity. And that principle should be reflected in a number of different areas of policy and practice. So, for example, how uh, the, the NHS uh, talks to patients about their work aspirations um, in, in what might, at least on the face of it, be just clinical conversations, uh, but also in helping uh, individuals living with obesity to have more of a say in the way their treatment happens and what outcomes they want from it. The second group we think um, can make a big difference in terms of outcomes for uh, people living with obesity are employers themselves. Um, we think that 
there are real things that employers can do in terms of making sure that their diversity and inclusion policies and practices are much more explicit about uh, obesity um, and the fact that people living with obesity um, will have um, concerns and issues about disclosure of their condition or any related health conditions, but also making sure that the way they do recruitment, progression, look at reward, um, look at workplace adjustments, all take into account the needs of people living with obesity, which may be very variable, um, but really important. We also think that employers who have um, active workforce uh, health promotion initiatives um, should make sure that they're not reinforcing stigma unintentionally. So things like nutrition programs, exercise programs, healthy eating and so on, um, should make sure that they're presented in a way that doesn't reinforce negative stereotypes. Um, and that's very important. We found that although some of these programs can be very positive and even evangelical, um, some people living with obesity can feel excluded by them. Uh, healthcare professionals are the third group. Um, it's still surprising to us that there are still some healthcare professionals who still use um, stigmatizing language or resort to the eat less, move more um, model. Um, and whilst that plays a part, it's a far more complex picture than that. And we think that healthcare professionals should be looking at the whole person, um, looking beyond the physical symptoms, bring to bear their understanding of what's called the biopsychosocial model. So recognizing that people living with obesity may also have vulnerability to some mental health problems. Um, we need as healthcare professionals to encourage self-management to try and ensure that patients can adopt strategies to manage aspects of their own condition, especially if they're staying in or returning to work. Um, and we also would like to see a bit more early intervention to direct people to the type of support that will help them. And finally, the media needs to play an important part in all this, um, as the fire has already mentioned. Um, using person first language is really important, Ava avoids labeling people um, because of their, you know, by their condition, using non stigmatizing images, uh, but also to make sure that obesity. Um, uh, stereotypical images of, of people with obesity and stereotypical language isn't used, um, particularly uh, if it resorts to uh, focusing on things like lack of willpower um, or using obesity as a source of humour. Um, I think that's a real concern. Um, despite the progress we make, sometimes we see some really quite embarrassing media coverage of people living obesity and that just reinforces stereotypes that people are very happy to believe. Um, in terms of the rest of the programme, um, you can look out as part of the Progress programme for a number of outputs from us over the next few months. We're doing some work to look at the business case for employers, a bit more specific about what they can do and why they should do it from a business point of view in terms of managing discrimination and stigma relating to obesity. Um, we're going to be producing some practical guidance for healthcare professionals, some guidance for employers, and then we're collecting more primary research data from a survey we're planning of people living with obesity, a survey of employers, and we're hoping to come up with a, a work charter which sets out some of these recommendations in a bit more detail as a rallying point around which all, all the stakeholders can, can get involved. I'll stop there, thank you. Steve, thank you very much. It, um, it almost seems to me, isn't it, we're almost like we were with gender 10 or 20 years ago where, um, you know, it's not me, you're all doing this out there, uh, but of course, I don't discriminate on the basis of a B to T. And I mean, those pay statistics just uh, frightening. Um, and we're sorry about some interference there on um, on on the south coast. Um, but um, yeah, you, in the report, as Steve says, there's there's quite a lot on the recommendations, and that's where some of the uh, other work's going to be. Um, going to be focused. Thank you as well for sharing. I'm, I'm losing touch here, just keeping in touch with the chat box and some of your questions. And, and for sharing, someone, um, someone shared, you know, their own personal experience there of uh, how they were treated and then the different treatment when they lost weight. It's just frightening, isn't it? Um, but um, I must introduce um, Dame Carol, um, and uh, I think some some of the areas, Carol, that have already been touched on in terms of what, you know, what what do we do? Do we need to make obesity a protected characteristic under the the 2010 Act? What what can we do about this? 
Um, and you've got such a brilliant perspective, both for, for large employers and for uh, policy. Um, can I invite you to, get, to give us a, a, some concluding uh, comments and, and, and thoughts from your expertise before, before we open it up? Thank you very much, Duncan. Well, I'm delighted to be asked to join you in this webinar and, and comment on what is a really excellent um, a report. And it pleases me so much because it expands on the obesity section in the report that Steve referred to, the 2016 report I did for government on employment outcomes of drugs and alcohol addiction and obesity. At that time, you will remember, we were asked to concentrate on individuals in the benefits system. A lot of those were far from the workplace. But I just want to take us back to my final paragraph, because um, you've really been doing government's work. I said um, my last recommendation to government in the review was given the current prevalence of obesity and future trends, and the potential scale of its costs for both government and individuals, we believe that government should consider the in-work aspects of obesity more fully. So we recommend that government undertake further research to investigate the impact of obesity on the working population. I'm sure you realize that nothing much happened then, but this report really shows that you started in a way doing their work for them, not that that should allow them off the hook. But I'm really pleased to see the way it's been picked up and that after your very thorough analysis, you're discerning to see change. And that as well as the many and very good recommendations, you've got this programme of work under your purpose banner. But please, while you're doing this work, do keep government's feet um, to the fire. And I just wanted to say that I think, and I think Steve, you mentioned it, that childhood obesity is so important because childhood obesity leads to adult obesity with all that means going into the workplace. Obese individuals, as you say, are discriminated against in so many ways in the employment cycle and and you've listed those and in every one of those areas we looked at just a very few of those you could see the effect of obesity you you've shown though this with so much wider and deeper evidence base than i did in 2015 and i thought that wage differential for obese women is so shocking and and as you said, we need to remember that it can last throughout working lives. And that obviously affects pensions and it affects financial well-being. I, I was pleased to see your comments on the big societal issues of poverty, deprivation and poor education um, and how that contributes to its obesity. And again, we must keep remembering that this lasts a life. Of your recommendations, and you've just talked about a few, I, I was very pleased to see the ones uh, for government, which I hope very much they will hear, heed. Um, this clinical outcome of care, uh, that work should be that, a primary clinical outcome of care. And again, health professionals, as you said, can help so much uh, in that way. And it really would be helpful for employers to have clear guidance on the legal status of obesity discrimination in employment. I believe employers can make a huge difference, especially if they have an encouraging and compassionate approach. And one thing I, I just wanted to add in this, we might like to think about the power of leadership. If you recall, when we were trying to get mental health seen as a normal part of life, and we all have positive mental health, and negative mental health, that if a CEO talked about their mental health and their issues, and we know that a lot did, when they had their own depression or stress, and then had said how they'd overcome it, dealt with it, and look where they were in their careers, then employees felt relieved and empowered and able to disclose and discuss their own issues. It is very powerful. And I wonder if a similar approach would help 
um, as you do your work on obesity. And I think it's also crucial that employers provide uh, the right healthy environment, whether it be food choices and availability or encouraging support to be more active. The number of workplace canteens and restaurants I've been to where the first thing you see uh, is really the unhealthy uh, food. And I think it would be helpful if employers could do the link up between what the workplace can do and what is happening outside in organizations like Weight Washers. Um, and, and I think that could be a really supportive, joined up approach. I wanted to really end by saying what I really ever say publicly. I often wish um, that I had used my own story more. I was a fat child. I, I looked like a little Michelin man. I was fed on bread and dripping, jam sandwiches, and cake. We were a very working class family and we didn't have much else. I simply hated being fat and it affected my schooling. I didn't want to go to the games field or in the gym. I didn't want to go to the parties and so on. It was a form of stigma but in the context of an educational setting. I then did have a light bulb moment. It was at a party when I was in the sixth form and I found myself in a turquoise party dress but bulging out of it and there was no one who wanted to dance with me. Something happened, something sort of broke inside me. I just was determined to lose weight which, which I did achieve. But still to this day, when I look in the mirror, I see a fat person, a fat child. So this makes me passionately keen to see childhood obesity taken very seriously and to do whatever we can in the workplace to ensure that people are treated with respect and supported and helped. But, but I digress. I just want to applaud what you've done and the aims of your purpose program and hope that you will be able to join up all those necessary elements of action by policymakers, employers, healthcare professionals and the wider public plus those people who suffer from obesity and who wish it were otherwise. So thank you again for having me. I'm just so happy to see this piece of work. Dame Carol, thanks ever so much. It's, isn't it, it's, it's almost one of the big paradoxes I find in this area that there's so many, everyone you talk to has got some personal experience or knows people. So we can really identify with this and yet we seem to be struggling uh, in organisations to, to address it uh, or even recognise it. And hopefully uh, the report can, as you say, help with, with both of those. And you've, you've also done brilliantly there don't care to address a number of the questions that folks have been firing, which I'm trying to keep an eye on here, um, particularly about the joined up, someone asking about the joined up nature of policy. Um, but also, I think you highlighted there the need for employers, government and healthcare to really join up on this, because, again, as with, with gender and racial stereotyping, it, it, it starts very early and we need to address it as far as possible, as well as deal with it in the workplace. And, and your guys, Gary, remind me as well, my two favourite journals in terms of uh, article, academic article titles, one of them is by a a colleague, a sociologist colleague at Catherine Appleford at, um, at Kingston. And the article is called uh, The Big Bum That Has Taken Over the World. And, um, you know, we can, we can do anything here, whatever we look like. Um, and uh, to get that over in organisations, I think, is critical. Can I just, um, um, d uh, there's questions around, will all the slides and material be available? Yes, it will, uh, including a recording, uh, this recording of the video. But can I just, I mean, there's a number of questions around, so what should I, as a busy kind of HR, diversity professional, whatever, what should I do? What's my two or three things to do? And 
can I put that to Var and Steve to you really to because I'm going to have to finish just at the eleven. Um, what are what are the two or three things that that really jump out for you for for our busy um, senior HR and diversity audience? Sophia, do you want to start? Yeah, just really quickly. I think my opinion is is really be careful about the language that you use. I think people first language is is something that really we really should be taking um, as important now. So to not um, to not define people by their condition, but to remember that they are people first. I think that's a really, really easy one for organisations to, to implement and to put in straight away. And um, I, you know, it's it's simple training. You know, we, we have training now about um, about gender and age and about how we should help um, and ethnicity in the workplace. And I just think ethnicity should be treated in the same way as every other protected characteristic, even though it's not under the Equalities Act. Um, I think that with the level of stigma and discrimination experienced by people living with obesity in the workplace, it should be treated as such. Brilliant, thanks. And Steve, I mean, should that you know what we've done on uh, gender and hopefully ethnicity pretty soon on on reporting on pay gaps? So we we force employers to to get that evidence, look at it themselves, and and expose it externally. Um, unconscious bias training, all all the things that that uh, we've got plenty of research on 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 gender and and increasingly on ethnicity as well. Should should we you know apply those? Um, tools here as well yeah i mean i think there are lots of soft things are going on underneath the surface as the virus identified with the employment cycle you know judgments being made at the point of recruitment what type of work you give people to do how you assess their performance and so on i think our wage penalty analysis shows that actually if you want to try and understand what the practical implications of all that are some of the hard measures you can look at are things like progression rates, labour turnover rates, but also wage wages. Um, and that's the real test of whether or not uh, the, the spirit of your diversity and inclusion uh, policies and practices are really working. Because if, if you see differential outcomes in terms of pay, all other things should be equal, then you've probably got a problem. And so you should use analysis of pay, whether that's reported or not as a way of triggering some sort of internal analysis of how you're doing. Right. And do you think, again, maybe, Carol, you're, you're best place to answer this one, and apologies for just running over a wee bit. I promise to finish in a minute. But do you think that the kind of balance here with the messages we're giving about get healthy, get fit, eat well, et cetera, and a bit, is that giving, is this one reason do you think that employers might be afraid to act in this area because of that? that kind of, of tension uh, with obesity, Carol? I, I, I think it's quite hard if you are overweight. Um, I mean, you're not, you, you see all these people in their Lycra and they're whizzing around, you know, um, the roads on their cycles, etc. cetera. I, I, I think there is obviously a, a desire for us all, whatever our shape or size, to keep as well as, as possible. But I think how these things are messaged is, is really very important. For a long time, I, just again, I, I, I think of my own experience, I would only go out and exercise in my um, hip when it was dark. I still thought of myself as not wanting to be doing it around other people. And, and I, I just, Think we have to really get our messaging and our support in the right place and and make sure that this this is a very balanced approach great thank you ever so much well listen we could we could go on for easily another hour and and there's some great stuff in the chat boxes thank you for everyone for taking part but i'd better draw it to a close um, or we'll put the details up um, in a slide, uh, just in terms of where this information. There we go. Uh, where this information is is going to be. Stephen and Zafire uh, will take any any detail questions as well. But um, do you know what? One of the things for me after um, 
George Floyd's death was was really to say I took on myself to to self educate myself on on ethnicity and race, uh, which I didn't know as much about as gender and employment. And I think this I'm taking away as well for the two or three things from this is really to boost my knowledge and and the report has really helped me with that already and hopefully it helps you but it you know if if um i think it was nelson mandela said strength uh, lies in difference not in similarity and i think that's you know that's one of the the key lessons to come out but i've always got as well the maya angelou quote that i kind of i look at not what you think but but what you do and how you behave and i think that area of what what we're going to do about this is a real uh, key one and um as as we said there's lots of ideas in the report already and the further research will will develop and and test some of those so listen thanks very much for you for listening in um thank you particularly to our guests um dan carroll and uh, on video, Sarah and uh, and Dr. Karani, um, and um, uh, yeah, let let's uh, continue this uh, as an important agenda item that we, we really think about and 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 pledge to do something on in uh, in twenty twenty one. Thanks everybody very much for taking part. Have a good rest of the day. <laughs>